Hello, hello everyone. Uh, sorry for being one minute late. Uh, we had a little technical problems. Uh, uh, we had the third speaker, which will pro hopefully join us in a, in a moment. He had some problems with a camera. Sandy also had uh, problems in the internet in the very last second. <laughs> but, uh, I hope uh, everything will be fine from now on. Uh, so maybe uh, let's start. Um, which is just welcoming uh, everybody here on the latest City of Craft Bytes. Um, today we'll look at the topic of how does your organization fit in the state of Frontend 22. Uh, if uh, this is the first time uh, you are here at the City of Craft Bytes, uh, let me first maybe tell you a bit uh, about this group. Uh, City of Craft is a mentoring and coaching community uh, for technology leaders uh, around the whole world, uh, focusing and supporting technologies in their leadership growth. Uh, community members are over 7,000 and CTO Craft provides them with one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring groups, uh, curated Slack community, by the way, I'm part of it, and uh, events like this one, for example. And thanks for the CTO Craft headline partner, AWS, for helping uh, make these Bytes events possible. Uh, I'm Mara Gaida, I'm CTO uh, and co-founder of the Software House, and today with me, uh, we have a wonderful guest. Uh, Joel Albert, a CTO of MCD Partners. Uh, thanks for joining us in the uh, in a very uh, early uh, early morning <laughs> because uh, Joel is from the US. Uh, so what time it uh, it is? Uh, it, on is it is six thirty a.m. So I woke up at five a.m. to get ready. To, so hopefully I'm all there for you guys. I'm still waking <laughs> up. So you, know, you have your, you have uh, you have your coffee with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't drink caffeine, so it's oh. also I have to just motivate myself through you know sheer will. Okay, so uh, uh, that's but yes. uh, that. So, so I, I, it, it will be challenging for me to come up with a very interesting questions and a very interesting discussion for sure, you. Sure. Uh, so, anything to add about you? Uh, uh, no. So, uh, yes, I work for for MCD Partners. We're a digital agency, um, and we we help customers sort of build the best possible consumer experiences uh, that we can. And I'm happy to be here. Happy to talk to you guys. Yeah, happy to have you here. Uh, our second guest is Sandil Kumar, uh, engineering manager at Uber and author of uh, books and uh, blogs. Sandil, yeah, anything from you? Sure. Hey, hey folks, I'm Sandil. Uh, I'm at Uber and um, currently working on ballot and payments in Uber oh. uh, as an engineering manager. And yeah, that, that's basically about me. I just finished my book on WebAssembly. And if you're interested, just have a look at it. That's it. Yep. And uh, we were supposed to have the third guest, uh, Gergely uh, Gergel, uh, Orosh, uh, writer and speaker, programming engineer. Uh, and uh, hopefully he will get to us uh, as soon as he uh, figures out uh, his technical problems. Um, well, uh, okay, let's start already. Uh, so we uh, we have gathered here uh, because of the newly released uh, report called the State of Frontend 2022. Uh, yeah, it's already 2022. Um, I will maybe pay, paste this. Uh, uh, this report on the on the chat if uh, if you uh, guys uh, haven't seen it but pay attention right now uh, no, don't don't uh, read it uh, right now you can read it after uh, after our discussion uh, so basically uh, this um, the idea of this of this report is that uh, there were uh, th there was a technological survey uh, uh, 3700 uh, developers were surveyed uh, about the preferences uh, on the tech stack what they like what they don't like what they want to learn uh, it was uh, it was surveyed over uh, 122 uh, countries so this is uh, uh, this was a pretty big uh, big survey <laughs> showing us the situation in the in the in the world okay i see gargley coming uh, hi gargley you're here now Yep. No. yep. Yep. I'm here. Yeah, you're here, but without a camera. Yeah. Right. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's uh, that's also fine. We'll have uh, just uh, just your voice. Uh, so maybe I will just introduce you to the to the last uh, speaker, uh, uh, Gergely uh, Orosh, uh, writer and speaker, a uh, programmatic engineer. Uh, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, Yep. So mm -hmm. I've 
uh, apologies for my my camera not working. Uh, that's a, a bit of a shame. But uh, I've I, I've been a software engineer for many years and an engineering manager working at places like Skype, Skyscanner, and uh, later at Uber. And I now write the Pragmatic Engineer, which is a widely read newsletter uh, where I cover big tech, high growth startups, and interesting trends. Uh, for example. Uh, you know how is this state of front end uh, progressing so uh we we worked a little bit together with this report i, I had a very little input and i'm also one of the people who analyzed the, the results and some things were interesting indeed yeah okay so uh uh yeah that's a that's a good good beginning uh because my actually first warm-up question was uh uh were there any surprises for you guys in this uh, in this report? What surprised you the most? What was the most interesting part? Uh, so, uh, uh, Joel, maybe. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think at least uh, this is probably a surprise, but also no surprise to anyone. But I think just the obviously the shift to work from home, mm -hmm. um, and I think just in general for our entire industry. Um, it's it's probably been one of the biggest you know surprises that um, has come out of even you know twenty all the way from twenty twenty into twenty twenty two, and it's been it's also been really a, sort of a nice thing that's that, that's happened at least for us, um, and it's it's helped to bring sort of the engineering community even closer together uh, in terms yep. of like with, you know everyone working in different spaces and um, being able to you know learn how to communicate directly through um, you know platforms like this or Zoom etc. Um, so to me that was. You know, sort of a, I think a nice surprise is seeing the industry sort of, you know, move forward with uh, work mm -hmm. from home and learning how, um, you know, to, to make sure teams can stay together mm -hmm. and engaged, uh, but working in completely separate places. So I think that was a, a, an interesting uh, surprise. Yeah. And uh, Sandil, uh, do you, uh, so what do you think about the working remotely apart, uh, according to the, to the tech stack? Does it impact uh, the tech stack in any way that we actually, oh, we have a good Hey, <laughs> finally. Um, yeah, okay. So repeating my question. Uh, so Sandil, uh, do you think that this remote work actually changes anything in the tech stack? I think uh, it is more of a convenience now and it, it doesn't have any straight impact on the tech stack or something like that. But of course, like the choices that you make, uh, the choices that you're gonna do, it kind of like pushes the changes, the bulk changes that you want to do slightly away because the more bulk changes, for example, moving from one framework to other framework, mm -hmm. that kind of changes, it's going to take longer time and it requires a lot of communication, back and forth communication, whiteboarding and all those stuff. Those are the kinds that kind of like takes a back hand and things like we, we kind of focus more towards like enhancing the things and developing and going across. Then that's, that's, that's not going to be a major shift over there. And that's how I believe. And I don't think there is any direct proportional relationship between working from home and, you know, uh, choosing a framework. I, I don't think that it's like the communication tools are there and everything works now. But the only thing is like major changes might get delayed because of the scenario or something like that uh, till people get comfortable. Once they get comfortable, then maybe they can go forward and do it. And that's how I see it. Yep. And uh, Georgie? Uh... You mentioned that there was some interesting stuff. So what was the most interesting or surprising thing for you? The most interesting for me is how many people actually do testing. So like <laughs> on, on back end, like doing testing is kind of like given because you can test your business logic, but on mobile and on front end, it's historically yeah. been pretty low. And or they, I, or they just say that in the survey. Well, or, or they just say, say that in, in, in the survey. And, and it is a little tricky because it's kind of unclear, like the people who answer the question of what kind of tests have you written uh, yourself? I don't think we gave a no test, so that might be a little bit misleading. But <laughs> I, I'm still kind of surprised that like the 90% who said they do unit tests, there's 60% who do integration tests. Like it is, and, and, and how many end-to-end -end tests there are. So like, uh, the, there's usually I would have expected a lot lower overlap like m people you know might write uh, I would have expected less unit test on front end because front end is let's be honest is not very unit testable uh, in terms of the the UI logic but the more business logic you bring onto the front end like with the stick clients or, or spas or whatever we call them it is more testable I, I think it's encouraging it's awesome to see so I, I love mm -hmm. like it seems to me front end is really maturing compared to the kind of software engineering practices, not just the hack to get a practice. So that was awesome to see. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting uh, that you you mentioned the the testing and the and the whole uh, the the whole comparison between the front end and the back end, right? Because uh, uh, okay, when when I started programming, uh, there wasn't some, so, such a thing like back and front end, uh, right? It was just just a development, and now we have this kind of specialization. But I already see th that uh, there are some ideas that. Uh, uh, all of those DevOps ideas, uh, with as you mentioned, writing unit tests, but also about uh, deployments, uh, Dockerizing stuff, right? And uh, and it starts to be more and more something between front end and a back end. So, what do you think, Sandu? Uh, it's uh, this will go in the direction that there will be like a more specialization on the front end and more on the back end, or will we get back to the origins and actually this will be the full stack DevOps kind of thing. I, uh, I feel that is a cycle uh, based on your question, but just yeah. before going to answer that, I will also comment on what Hirge said, like on the unit test part, it kind of correlates with the tools that they're using because on unit test we have test and testing library, which kind of comes up at top. That is really nice. But the one area where I think we don't have something like visual test over there, and there is no other phenomenon of like no other testing tools that kind of does the visual test is missing. That is something we could add in the future. But that is also one other area where it's creeping up. And that directly contributes because of the DevOps and all those cycles that we have. And to your question, uh, the front end and the back end kind of like has this fluctuating behavior where like, uh, front end slowly creeps into back end and then suddenly everything pulls away and then like they go to normal 50 50 and then come back i do see a lot of trends are happening at this point of time for example server side rendering along with like uh you know uh, suspense and server components which react is working on and react and these are the things that kind of like shifts focus on like moving everything to server and doing most of the things on the server and then pushing the content to the web to make it appear faster to have better performance and these are really nice things that are happening, but it's slowly like here, the front end is slowly going to the back end space and trying to do a lot of things. Jamstack and full stack, kind of all, mm -hmm. all those fancy names you can put there kind of addresses that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it eventually goes away and then there will be a lot of other things will come up from the back end and they fill the void. And that's how it's going to happen. But there is right now, front end is slightly starting to creep up and achieving more of the back end side of things. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for also referring to, to Dirty. Uh, this is this. Uh, it doesn't have to come all the questions from me. You can also like discuss uh, dynamically sure. between uh, each other. Also, I encourage uh, the audience uh, to ask the questions. Uh, we have a we have a tab here as a question where you can uh, ask any question, and I will just uh, will just discuss this, or you can write any kind of comments on the chat uh, ch chat on the on the right hand side, and uh, and uh, and and we'll refer to that. Uh, okay. And uh, so, what is uh, what is actually most uh, uh, surprising for me uh, is the situation of the Angular. Uh, it's uh, uh, so I know that this was the first. I mean, is is it surprising? <laughs> this, uh, yeah. Okay. This is the question. Uh, but um, uh, I, I still remember. I, I, I mean, I mean we we, ju we just retired Internet Explorer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That was was that, uh, that was that yesterday, are, right? There, there are parallels between IE and Angular. Uh, okay. And do, and we are talking about this new Angular, not this Angular JS, because uh, mm. <laughs> this is uh, just Angular. Is, is yeah uh, right. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I remember this was the first framework of this type, and uh, it was supported by Google, and it was supposed to be the thing, right? The the the, the golden hammer and uh, and uh, and holy grail of the of the front end development. And uh, so what what happened? It's it's not even on the first uh, on the first three choices it's on the fourth and if you will just look at the uh, popularity for the future it's like only eight percent of the of the people want to uh, learn angular in the future so it's even worse so so what happened judging uh we react happened right is that the <laughs> <laughs> um no, I think I think Angular gets sort of a, a little bit of a bad rap just because I think you know I I give Angular a lot of credit. It's it, it sort of uh, spurned a huge you know um, uh, flood wave of front end developers. I mean, it really you know for for mm -hmm. its time, I thought it was 
um, actually quite good. And we built tons of applications on, on Angular and some of those applications still exist today. Um, you know, they're, they're obviously aging out now. A lot of them are being, you know, moved over to either React or Svelte or some mm -hmm. other, you know, version of that. Um, but I, I think what ended up happening really with Angular was more so a mismanagement just of, um, you know, getting into Angular too. We, we, we have that comparison of uh, Angular JS versus Angular. And, you know, there was a, a whole period of time. I, I want to say it's, it's escaping me now, but it's like, you know, six or seven months up to a few years where people were waiting to see what Angular 2 was going to be. At the same time, you had React really gaining steam in the background. Uh, and they sort of failed to deliver on, I think, the old Angular developers and how they knew to build those products. And then what the, you know, the new sort of enterprise level Angular JS 2, I think it was called at the time. And, and, and though there was a big mismatch there. You know, I think mm -hmm. the true Angular developers at the time were a little bit, you know, taken aback by the structure of how you would work within Angular 2. Uh, and then similarly, I think people had already been working with React and saying, you know, this is working really well. You know, I don't really need to go back to this Angular thing, and, and nor do I want to relearn Angular. I'm already relearning or learning React. Um, and so that that sort of juxtaposition created, you know, so a groundswell for React, and people, I just think, didn't look back. And if you're in enterprise, and I, I see it, you know, I, we work with a ton of different uh, institutions, and a lot of those people, especially in the Java world, they love Angular too, right? It exists still in a, a smaller space, but that that gives them all the tools they need to sort of be successful, uh, especially coming out of a, you know sort of a Java world. Um, so it does exist. I just think that on whole, people moved into React and said, "Okay, I feel good here. I'm not going to go back and and learn Re uh, Angular too." Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah that, I, yep. Sandeep, uh, ju ju just to touch up a little bit on that, like I was personally involved in Angular one to Angular two migration and many open source projects and I was doing that for seven months. Every week there would be a baking build and you just have to redo everything. Uh, on the other hand, like people kind of like evolved, right? Angular came and kind of like, I, I'm going to give everything to you and you just have to adhere to norms and then just build these things. But React came in like, I'm just a view library. You can put anything you want. And that's, that's a major difference I see and that kind of promoted people to focus on uh, React and view or spell, whatever you call it. But Angular gained a less problem popularity based on that. On the other hand, with Angular 14, they're also rethinking their strategy. The standalone components had come in and also a few things that they're doing on the baseline modifications. I think this would trigger a little bit, but again, the learning experience has to be there. I have to learn another framework and write it completely new. And that is a problem that people is gonna have. And they will go for much fancier and much more simpler frameworks like Swell rather than like going in a complex world of Angular and try to redefine everything. And that is the bigger problem that you're seeing. Swell. Yeah. So what do you think about Swell? Uh, it's also a, just a very interesting uh, kind of topic. It was supposed to be the next React like two years ago, I believe. Yeah, Spell is really, really interesting. I, I, I mean, like it's much closer to metal. It's, it's as simple as HTML and JavaScript. There is no fancy elements over there. There is no fancy stuff. It just uses the platform in a correct way that is has to be used and put in all the bells and whistles that makes it easier for you. I personally, I love Spell, but I think it, it will take a little more time for it to get mature and move forward because uh, React and Vue are further down the line and Spell needs to catch up, a lot of catch up to do to reach there. And the features parity between these frameworks definitely matter. But I see good developer experience as well when compared yes. with other things. We have a yes. question from, we have a question from the audience. Um, uh, it's a, uh, it's kind of uh, technical, but uh, okay, let's, uh, let's try to see this. Uh, do you see any hazard uh, example in the security in using web sockets uh, to make SPAs auto refreshable? Who wants to answer this? I I can take that if if that if, if I understand the question correctly, it's mm -hmm. basically like does uh, using a web socket introduces any vulnerability or security issues in your site? Is that the question? If that is the question, then I think there are ways to make it secure. There are ways to make the secure communication happen and things like that. But again, like any of the new platform that you're going to introduce, even if you talk about Clipboard API and Geolocation API, all of them comes with some security vulnerability attached to it. So it's basically like how you make sure as a developer 
to protect that smaller bundle or protect that thing that you're doing and, and for pushing that across and then del delivering that and browsers, vendors, the vendors of the browsers, also trying to make sure they're closing all those gaps as soon as it is found out. So I think there is, there is a vulnerability across most of the APIs that is going to develop because web is an omni-channel platform. It's not a single platform that kind of like in a closed ecosystem, it's an open ecosystem. So there will be possibilities of security reasons there, but most of them are prevented by the vendors, the browser vendors. And as a developer, you need to be aware of like, it's, it's, you need to do your due diligence of like making sure that you're not including any security vulnerability and you're testing your sites tools like uh, LGTM and uh, GitHub security vulnerability channel, uh, code scanning and all those things would help you to make sure like your code that you're putting it out kind of does not have any security vulnerability and things like that. So you can use, utilize those things and ensure that you're developing in a much secure environment. Yeah, yeah and I, I just said like, you just want to assume like the users are malicious. They're actually mm -hmm. trying to attack you. That's one. <laughs> yep. The other thing, if you're big enough, if you're big enough of a company, you should get a security audit. Like, like you know, you 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 can prepare for all these things, but every time at Uber when we got a security audit, holy moly! Like they came and they took it apart. They brought their tools and they didn't, didn't mess around. They actually, because you know these are guys who go into these companies and they're paid whenever they find something, so they yeah. actually build their custom tools and they will rip it apart. So it's kind of like you know, if you have something that's big enough that's making a million dollars or ten million dollars or hundred million, you want to get those people. If your app is small enough and you're, you're not even making any money. I mean, you know, like do best practices, but the damage like hopefully will not be that big there. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Th those, those audits are amazing. They will always find something. This is, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. But uh, as, uh, as always, uh, uh, with any kind of hazards, you have to uh, be aware of the tools that you're using. Uh, basically this is the, <laughs> the yeah. general idea. Uh, okay. And, um, so going back to the discussion, uh, I don't want to grill uh, Angular uh, anymore, but maybe in the general, uh, let's say we have a, I'm a manager and I have on, uh, a technology that is like, for example, Angular or anything else. Uh, the, the report like this states that it will go down at some level or it will not be the the most uh, important one in the market let's say right so what i should do right now as a, as a cto or as a manager right rewrite the whole system get rid of it just stay with this or what georgie i mean like to, to me like these reports are a little bit tricky like it's pretty cool to see where the market is and i think it's really useful when you're looking like what is easy skills to hire but it doesn't tell your story so you know what what this doesn't tell is like a lot of banks are using angular so if you're a bank and you're using angular you're fine you're a bank you, you pay a bunch of money you're you don't have problems to hire the other thing that it doesn't show is there's a lot of people who can do these things for example for angular it is pretty easy to hire or like it's not impossible to hire let's say contractors but going back like i, I think with anything like you need to look, look pragmatic like here's what we're using today it, question a is like does it solve our problem today and if it does you know, don't break what's working. What I usually encourage people to do is when you're building new stuff, you know, that's a great opportunity to decide to build something new. Uh, now, if you're, and, and also the other ones, listen to your team, like have retrospectives. And if your team keeps complaining about, you know, Angular, you know, there you want to drill into like what is what's happening? Is it the is it the migrations? Is it the hard developer experience? Like a team that has like an app that they don't touch, that's fine. But but then like there's a balance of how much do you want to get left behind and here's an interesting thing like you might think like oh we should always go with the latest like in this look at the report do react or, or maybe do view because it's second or or do svelte if you're really brave but uh, i talk with some uh, uh, successful bootstrap companies and the way they run their company these are profitable like they're, they're making a profit no venture capital investment and they're actually really conservative in their choices and and they tell people and they do it with their employees they, it's not like the cto it's actually the engineer saying saying hey we're not going to be able to hire a bunch of people to learn a bunch of new stuff you tell me what you want to do and people often like boring stuff because you know if you're cutting edge of react like it might have changed now but all those react had the same migrations no one really wants to do it so uh you know talk with your team if you have a young team and they're in terms of like you know professionally young uh they they love doing new stuff it's a different thing maybe you do want to do and they don't mind setting up late nights to like update the latest efficiency <laughs> so talk to your team 
don't get caught up just by the reported and trends. And you know, the worst thing you can do, do not follow the hype. Like I'm saying, this is someone who worked at Uber. A lot of people asked us what we're doing. And I always told them, I can tell you, but don't don't copy us blindly. Do what <laughs> works for you. And a mature framework that is not being deprecated, honestly, might be a better choice. I might be talking against, you know, what a lot of people here want to hear. But I, I'm interested in what, what, what you guys think, Joel and, and uh, Sendil. So I, I, I 100% agree. I think the, the biggest thing that's or the biggest thing is happening right now is sort of there, there's a normalization happening on front end, right? It's it's almost like people can finally breathe and be like, okay, you know what? I'm fine with React. And we, we do a lot of work internally with sort of asking questions back to the team, exactly like you're saying. What do you want to work on? What do you find frustrating? What's new that's coming out that you think is going to benefit uh, any consumer or customer that we're building a product for? I think those are the right questions to ask. And it's like you say, you, you can hire anyone that's good at JavaScript and they'll learn a framework. I, I think there tends to be this idea that, you know, I'm a React developer or I'm a Svelte developer, which is really, first of all, it's not pragmatic at all. I mean, you should learn the system, learn web APIs, be a part of the ecosystem, but don't like, put all of your eggs in one basket thinking that it's going to be, you know, this way for forever. If there's the one thing that we know about front end and we, I think we all can agree on this is it changes, changes a lot. Um, and, you know, if you can find sort of a, a space where you can be extremely productive, you have a large ecosystem where you can rely on other developers and open source. Um, that's a pretty good bet to, to, to make. I mean, you'll know that, you know, within a few months, you're probably still going to be there. Your product will still be, um, you know, something that you can work on and, uh, and update. And, and that's a great thing. I, mean, I think we've kind of lost that with front end. And we we sort of envy the back end that can be you know working in Rails for the last six years and or or, or you know uh, uh, working in Python and they're relatively stable. Um, stability is not a bad thing. You know, stability is a very good thing. Uh, so I, I mean, I, I totally agree. I think it's it's kind of nice to see the market uh, being a little bit more cohesive right now. Yeah. yeah, I really like what you said. I think we should just repeat that like if you're a, a engineering leader engineering manager do not assume that you need to hire a svelte or an angle or a react developer Absolutely. people can learn it in a month if you hire someone Easy. who's done software for a few years and did a little bit of front end even if they did back end by the way uh, yeah if, if they, they can pick it up in one or two months uh, and especially if you're struggling to hire people like especially when you choose something you know mature like this this might be bad like you know angular will have good resources to tell you how it's done and it's pretty opinionated so that might be yeah. an advantage but we should totally stop you know like i think it's kind of okay to like check if you know javascript or, or typescript at some level that's even questionable because if you, if you know java you can pick it up but you're putting yourself in, in a hole and you're going to get a lot more expensive people a lot harder if yes. you're that's that's your approach so just want to plus true. one you yeah. yeah, I think I, I completely agree with it. And this, these are the things that we constantly see happening. It's not that React developer goes and fixes things. It's just that JavaScript developer comes and helps you across to move forward. That I perfectly agree. I've been part of this kind of migrations, bigger migrations, like thousands of files of AngularJS to React migration, AngularJS to Angular migration. I've done all those horrible activities before <laughs> and been part of those things. And it's time consuming one. And the other thing is like in the current environment, if you're trying to make sure like you're just going to invest a lot of effort onto it and the benefit is not there, then these are the projects that get axed straight away. So like think about it, whether you really want to do it, unless otherwise it's going to be end of life support or end of security support and everything is going to happen, for example, in AngularJS, where everything was ended. So that's the main reason we have to migrate. If you don't have it, and it's just the complaints that you're hearing, then just take your time, think about it, what is the investment that you're going to make, how long does it going to take, and put up a progressive plan, like side load them together and then run few new components in React or old components in Angular, do that migration and work, live with it. But if you do this, then the life of the developer is going to get even more messier, then it'll stop complaining, I guess. So that is what you can also do. But on the other hand, it's always like going on the progressive mindset and just picking the things that is not fancy, that not because they are fancy, but picking the things that they actually going to work for you and make your life much more simpler. So that's yeah, that's a, that, no, that's a, I think that's brings up another really good point is that I see this a lot in, in, in especially even, even larger companies that they have to migrate to the latest framework. There, there's no benefit, right? Like if, if your application is working, your consumers are happy, performance is good. You know, just saying, well, if we go to hire, we, we're not going to get React developers. And we need React developers because that's what all developers are. And yet you have this Angular mm -hmm. application working perfectly fine. And now you have to build a seven-month, six-month, you know, sort of lead time migration plan just to get to another framework so that you can hire people to fit the framework. 
Um, and that conversation comes up probably more than I would like to hear. If if the product works well and you have good reactions from your consumers, uh, there is no reason outside of security or some other concern to switch to a completely different framework. It's um, there, There's a little bit of brand awareness, I think, that seeps into our programming world where you need to be sort of representing the right brand, uh, whether that's Angular or Svelte yeah. or whatever. And that, I think, brings a lot of other problems to the situation. But. Yeah. Like uh, two weeks ago, I was actually on a different podcast and the guy there said that it is more like a religious thing or uh, <laughs> uh, or, or, or like like a religious beliefs or cultural beliefs uh, uh, on the on it's those frameworks. Cool. And um, yeah, but uh, basically, it's very hard to find fight it. And uh, what you said, Joel, is kind of interesting about the hiring uh, because um, I had this uh, situation a couple of months ago. While one of our clients just uh, had a front end in Open UI. This is the name, uh, Open UI Five, I think. And uh, they wanted to switch to React. And uh, basically, I said why they want to do it, right? And I was expecting this kind of uh, conversation with rhetorical things like maybe speed or uh, legacy code or whatever. And basically, the answer was as simple as it is because it was uh, because we cannot hire open UI developers. And people that are there, they said that they want to program in React. And we have to spend a lot right now to just switch to react because this is what the developers want uh so my question is who is actually driving this market right now is it, is it the, the mm -hmm. developers or the business or the or the management how how do you see this well i, I definitely think developers mm -hmm. drive the market i i think in general people mm -hmm. um you know, I, I think I could come up and say, okay, we're going to build the next, you know, 20 applications in Svelte and uh, this is the way things are going to be. In, in, but at the end of the day, if, if, if I come to work as a developer and I hate the thing I'm working on, uh, I don't enjoy it. It's not a framework that I feel productive in. I think you're going to see that. I think that's going to, you know, um, if the ecosystem doesn't support it and all these other things that come along with um, frameworks, then I, I don't think you're going to get much traction. Um, you know, it's it's the same. I hate to go back to Angular, but it's the same sort of discussion. Is right. You know, Angular is good in um, in that sense where if you've if your team's already been learning it, it's it's working well. You have some connection on the on the Java side, and then you know that's completely fine. But if I come in tomorrow as a as as a, a leader and say we're going to switch everything to React, I don't think everyone's going to be on board with that. You know, unless they want to do that, it's something that they want to do. I think you really need developer buy-in uh, to move a market. I think it's just a, a need. Uh, you guys, yeah, I, think, that's okay. I think along with the developer, I think deadlines also makes a bigger thing. If you have a very tight deadline, then people just take whatever they're comfortable with. And if you don't have it, if you have that liberty there, then that also makes a bigger decision, bigger, bigger uh, investment in the decision. And the other part of the equation is basically the developer experience that these frameworks are providing. Like right now, you have frameworks like Next.js or Next which kind of gives all the batteries that is required for you to run your application and then put everything together and then just delivers all the content that you stayed away. People are more comfortable in doing that. The, the better the developer experience that is going to get, people are mm -hmm. naturally going to get attracted towards there and they're going to develop over there. And that, that also plays a major role. So all these framework creators, they kind of like focus on like bringing that developer experience as good as possible and the deadline that is marching along, then people mm -hmm make the choices based on these two things. And of course, I, I do 100% believe developers make that decision. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just gonna say that I'm, and this might feel silly on a panel, I don't really understand how the hell front end is changing so darn much. Like, <laughs> like I'll, I'll give you, and you know, this is, I, I'm, I'm the one, both of you are really in the depth of this. I'm not in the depth of this at, at Uber, I manage the front end team and, you know, I, I'm kind of a more of a hobbyist on the front end. So I, I don't have the mm -hmm. main knowledge, but mm -hmm. I, what I do see, I, I see the kind of differences uh, and similarities across mobile and back and mobile is very simple because there's two vendors, yeah. Apple and, and Google, whatever they do, however, they kind of, you know, do the music, everyone dances accordingly, especially with Apple, Google gives a little bit more, more freedom, but like Apple runs the show there. On, on, on the back end, it's interesting because I feel whatever happened on the back end is now happening on the front end, but at a lot kind of smaller Impressive. time frame. So if you think back for the back end, because I think it's just good to get a little historic context, uh, small talk, this language in the 80s started to become super duper popular. And then there was this other language called Java. And small talk was a lot better, but Java had a lot better marketing. Small talk didn't have marketing folks. And this was back in the 80s before, you know, the internet barely started. And small talk slowly died. 
uh, and while, while Java with Sun uh, took uh, started, started to go up. But then we had other vendors, you know, the Microsoft Empire showed up with C Sharp, which they basically built uh, something that was just as good as Java. And there was a bit of a religion between you being a Microsoft D or an Oracle. And then, uh, and then open source started to come in. So the languages like, or not well, free to use languages, because these all, all had some license costs, both Java and, and C Sharp. So there was things like PHP, like uh, uh, later uh, Go came along. And a lot of companies now, companies start to kind of differ based on what, a kind of licensing model or what vendors they like the microsoft world is still there and it's still very strong just on the back end there is the kind of the java legacy which which has uh, like it's, it's still very strong and super mature and now there's a whole host of things like rust and go and uh and then node.js you know it came to the back and there's and those are companies who mm -hmm. are really believing in open source and there's a community aspect as well so what was interesting to see is how and i'm not saying the front end will repeat but after a while, there's a little bit of ideology as well. And mm -hmm. uh, on the back end, developer experience was always kind of a given. Like we, we never, like the back end is a little bit, I, I guess, simpler that it, it plays a role. But what will be interesting to see, and, and this, I just summarized 30 years of, of back end, back <laughs> yeah, and forth. And, and right. on the topic, right? <laughs> but natural. what I feel is on the front end, the past 10 years has been an absolute whirlwind. Uh, yeah. Like browsers are becoming a bit more powerful. Google, you know, Google Chrome, uh, like Internet Explorer, ten years ago was dominating the market, and now mm -hmm. it, it just got retired. It's it's yeah. ridiculous. Uh, so uh, so my take is, I would pay attention to like I'm kind of surprised that Google is not weighing in a little bit more in terms of the uh, like you know the fact that like Angular is not doing great or they're not placing best. They, they clearly are building the browser, but they could build a framework one day. M maybe they will decide to either fund a winning framework. Or start one which kind of plays the strengths of their browser. I'm because micro, you know, they're they're like Google is the Microsoft of the web. Like whatever Microsoft yeah. did on on the thick line. So that's one thing that I, I would be surprised if Google didn't do that later. Something you know, either take over project because React is the most popular framework, and Facebook, we don't know them for developer experience. Like you know, if, if you told me like what is the company that is like driving front end, my last choice would be Facebook because Microsoft, Great. Google. Uh, even Oracle have more history with developers than Facebook, and Facebook typically doesn't is not there. So anyway, this is just my kind of outsider thoughts. I I think it's a whirlwind. It's I just I just find it fascinating. And uh, you know, I, I, what you guys said, like every team should should focus on developer experience. You should make pragmatic choices. But when you take a step away, it's still interesting how it's just changing. And and maybe it's now settling with React. I don't know. My my honest fear with React is, and you know, no offense for for anyone on the React team, but. It, it like I, I don't I haven't I haven't seen a track record of Facebook consistently like setting a track and and doing something uh, for the long term for developers because they are a company honestly funded ninety eight percent by ads so that'll be it could be interesting like is and mm -hmm. how, how it's it's spun up so this is a little bit of philosophical mm -hmm. but uh, it's awesome to be like I think front end is one of the most exciting it's, it is the most exciting thing to it see. is the back end yeah. is slowing down mobile is yeah just you know pay attention to Apple and front end is it's it's up for grabs yeah that's true um it's um but uh, is it still this kind of uh, very very dynamic or it starts to be stabilizing because uh yeah it I re I recall like uh, three years ago it was like uh, every month new framework uh, kind of stuff now what do you guys think it's uh, it's more stable or it, it it is slowing down. I think one of the things that's helping it sort of slow down, and we, we've been bringing this up, is this idea that it's not really front end anymore. You're really sort of going back now to this idea of full stack, and and I, and I think you brought it up earlier too of just having um, these ecosystems now. Next.js, I think Remix is uh, um, it hasn't been talked about I think enough because it really Remix as a framework really brings the web API to the front, which is huge, right? It's this idea that like. If you know enough about just basic web APIs, you can take that knowledge, apply it to something like Remix. You can get your your server, your state manager, your front end, your back end, everything all into one package. Uh, and I could build an entire application as one developer. That wasn't something you could really do before. You needed this back end. You need someone to write your APIs. You needed a back end person. Um, that is going away. That's eroding away. And we're sort of going back to this idea of just being a developer, not being front end or back end. Um, I think this is going to be huge in the next, you know, two or three years. You're, you're, you're taking away the need to have all these different components and you're starting to build people or give people a, a, an entire framework in which to build 
a total application and serve that application on 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 the edge, right? You, with cloud computing and edge computing, um, you don't have to be a DevOps wizard. You can you can start to do these things and deliver them at blazing fast speeds. Um, so I think we are seeing a little bit of that compression, which is it, it's great. You know, you don't have to worry about am I is the is the skill that I'm learning today going to be there tomorrow? Which is, I think, the people. You know, if you're in the front end space, you've been thinking that for the last five years. You know, is <laughs> React one day? Is Facebook going to close down tomorrow and say we don't want to support this anymore? Good luck. Um, yeah. Which I don't think would happen. But yeah. that that's a very real thing that people think about in the front end space, which yeah. you don't have in in Rails and in Ruby in general or other uh, back end frameworks. Yeah, I, I will slightly <laughs> contradict that one, but there are like new frameworks that are coming in even today, and like things like Solid JS, Alpine JS, and all those things that are coming in today. Yep. Uh, but, but the fundamental difference that we are forcing today is like people are moving, as Joel said, like people are moving towards the, you know, full scam stack kind of an application where they want all the bells and whistles attached and they just don't want a single framework that kind of like, that just gives certain things for them and they want everything together when they're bundling an application. But there are still folks who are, who wants like minimal stuff and they want to recreate everything all by yeah. themselves and that community is still there and we are building a lot of components for them. A lot of things are built for there. That is also there. So it is a general friction that we have over there, here and there, and that's how we should see it. And I think the fear for any developer, fear for any front end developer should not be there if they, are, if they have the basics of JavaScript and the HTML and CSS stuff. But if they come as a React developer and they be like a React developer and call themselves a React developer, then they have to rethink their strategy like what will happen mm -hmm. next five years because we have already seen Flow.js getting deprecated because Facebook said they're, gonna, they're not going to support it. Now, how long does React going to hold? It will hold for a longer time, but what is going to happen if they said they are not going to publicly support that? Where will everybody go? So these are the things that needs answer. But for that, a developer should be prepared. For example, do have like basic vanilla JavaScript and CSS. Yeah. knowledge that will help them a lot yeah and i should clarify too like i don't think it's you're still gonna have innovation and you're like you said you're still gonna have tons of new new frameworks i i think the real slowdown does come just in how people are writing these uh writing their frameworks like even even using svelte as an example which is brand new you have svelte kit now right which is trying to sort of be a part of that uh next js nuxt right that 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 same environment the, the idea now i think is just that you're you're getting an ecosystem more so than just a framework. And there might be new frameworks that there will be new frameworks that come up, um, but seeing this, just seeing everything move towards this all in one bundling, um, I think is really exciting if you're a developer, because you can, you can really build full products now uh, with two or three developers and, and get a ton out of the box. Um, so that, I think that's like the, the sort of the key takeaway um, in terms of those things. Yeah, interesting. But uh, well, we should maybe have a, a Angular drinking game. Uh, but uh, uh, isn't uh, because I will mention Angular one more time. But uh, it, wasn't this the one, one of the failures of the Angular that it had too many things on the board? Uh, this is what I at least I had is that uh, well, Angular was supposed to be this one-stop shop that you have everything uh, there, right? And the React won this battle because it was flexible, small. And uh, there, there were just tools around it. So, what's the truth? Uh, it, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. I think I think the major difference between Angular and the full stack applications like Next.js and all those things, Angular kind of like focused themselves on like providing that NPF front end package framework that kind of has service layer, module layer, and all those different different services, different layers, and they all contribute towards the front end, and they all contribute like just calling an API and then getting all those things. But what these other frameworks like Next.js and things like the broaden is like, how do you deploy it easily? How do you ensure that you get server-side rendering out of the box? How do you ensure all those things which developer has to spend a lot of time to make sure that they are following all the best practices, learn from hundreds of different locations, and then put everything inside the application. It's right out of the box and everything is cleanly tested, battle tested by the community and also has uh, unit testing and all those testings that after. So that is the biggest jump yeah. or biggest change. And that's where I think Angular kind of lost, but other framework kind of won't. Yeah. You, you bring up a great point too with, uh, I, I don't know if accessibility is big with you guys, but mm -hmm. you know, in the, we, we work, work a lot in financials and it's imperative, right? It's a, it's a key component of everything we de deliver. And now what you're getting out of the box with a lot of these frameworks is they're thinking of accessibility before they even deliver it to you. You know, we, we spent tons of time, uh, money and effort 
you know, working on uh, screen readers, uh, making sure um, blind people can operate, um, uh, you know, a UI. Um, all of these things that take a lot of effort. I don't think people tend to really understand just how much accessibility matters, but yeah. even how much it is to implement it and do it correctly. Um, these are, you know, sort of two, two separate things. And now these frameworks are thinking about this. The community is looking at these things. You're, you're getting UI libraries that have all of that stuff built in uh, and you're saving tons of time. I mean, just a, a massive amount of effort um, in doing these things. And that's what these frameworks really bring. It's, it's that developer experience. You guys brought it up earlier, but you know, if I can start a project, which is one of the hardest things to do, right? Just start, pick pick a pick a foundation and say, okay, we're going to build a product. Uh, that's what this affords me. It takes away the stress of building the platform, building the architecture, taking time to think all these things through. Now I have an architecture. I know it works. Like you said, the community battle tests it. Um, mm -hmm. I can contribute to that idea and we can push this forward. And now I can start, you know, tomorrow and get working on an application right away. I think that stuff is... Uh, sort of really changing the game in front end. You know, you don't have to sort of pick and choose uh, like you did before. And, and maybe, maybe this is what, you know, I, I was saying earlier, like, you know, what, where is Google? Like, they, they could be, you know, owning some part of it. But if you look at where the VC funding is going, because the VC funding, you know, they're, they're going to pour millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions in something they think will be the future, not for the next year, but for the next 30 years. And I think the, the end game here is pr pretty clear. You look at Vercel, you look at Netflix, especially Vercel. I, I just interviewed uh, on, on my newsletter, Mal Malte Ubel, who, who was at Google for 11 years, and he recently joined Vercel. And what I see, for example, Vercel doing is they're huge on Next.js. They're actually contributing hugely. They're tying it to their platform. So I think the end, end game is give this amazing developer platform where once you've chosen them, you're never going to leave them because why would you? If if right. there's no more friction points, you know, with, when, when you're migrating from Angular to somewhere else, you're going to do because you have friction points of either a migration or this or that. But if if they're able to get rid of these friction points and as you say get give all these things out of the box that you no longer have to build basically with the layman's term with a smaller team i can do more it, it'll be yep. cheaper for me as a cto whatnot and if there's a company behind it which can guarantee that you know migrations will be seamless and all that stuff they're gonna win and that's probably 100%. like everyone wins right the industry wins uh, i mean the only thing people who don't win is who want to do the next thing but you know now is their <laughs> opportunity to uh, offer something even better so I, I, I love I, how we touched on developer experience, even this was not our goal, I think, but I think it's key. I, I can't agree more. I mean, I, we, we look at things like security when we're building new products and, and now I can go to, you brought up Vercel. I'm a huge proponent of Vercel. We love them simply because we don't worry about security. We don't worry about these infrastructural things that will keep me up at night wondering, you know, who's going to give me a call at 3 a.m. and tell me something's wrong with my app. Uh, that's their problem. Right. And, and if you could do that and I could say, I'm just going to empower the developers to build the product I want to build. And I don't worry about any of those other things. Like you said, it's a no brainer. There, there's no reason to get, say, yeah, I want to go off and, you know, uh, build my own AWS instance and create all these different components and then manage those components and hire a DevOps team. And like, you know, you take all that away and all you're left with is the product. Uh, that that to me just seems like there there is no loser in that scenario. I, I agree. I get and I, and I do agree. The only loser is the one that wants to build that product, right? But um, this is the time to do it. Um, and uh, you know we've got a lot of uh, of of new stuff in this space, um, cloud computing, edge computing, all these things. These companies are realizing this, right? That the platform is kind of the the, the overall uh, where 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 they're going to win, uh, and the frameworks can just attach themselves to this platform. So um, yeah, hundred percent agree. And so speaking about the empowerment and uh, uh, and uh, if people are uh, able to decide on their own on the on the tech stack because the, now actually the technology allows that uh, micro frontends for example or other stuff there you can actually mix uh, the, the whole service oriented architectures and cultures basically basically uh, are able to, uh, to 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 work on the on the completely different box stacks uh, both front end and back end uh, but is it a good idea that actually uh, you have for example five teams and all each of them has like a different tech stack uh, but you are empowering them because they, they 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 just get to choose right or it's better to to have a consistent tech stack sender what do you think yeah i think uh, in this in this question right it kind of touches down back to microservices the way in which that like, get bought in it kind of like 
made sure that everything was easier. But on the other hand, it increased the organizational complexity as well as the deployment problems that we are going to have. And similar to that, micro front ends will also have the same problem. Now you need to have a specific specialized platform team that takes care and that tells the condition, hey, if you're using React, you should adhere to React version 15 or 16 to not take anything new and put it inside. That will increase the bundle size, that will decrease the performance of the application. So these are the things that they should be aware of. And this is the basic platform that we need when we jump into micro front ends. I see a lot of teams just go to the fanciness of micro front end and start implementing it. And the first thing they complain whenever we go and talk is like, hey, we did this and now I have two versions of React. I don't know which one to choose and my application just fails. And this is a common problem that we are seeing. There are a lot of solutions out there, but again, yeah. like this is so fundamental and we are missing that part. I think micro front end should address that. We should have a robust set of libraries that kind of helps you to do it and a good platform team that kind of contains everything out. Yep. I yeah, and, and and si well, as you say, size matters, right? In these discussions, you know, if 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 I'm a team of five, uh, we shouldn't all be using different languages, and you know, just saying, well, I like this, but this will other that that's a little ridiculous. Size really it plays the largest role here. Um, if you can be more productive in the language, and you can build teams based on one specific language, and you have you know hundreds of thousands of lines of code, you know, tons of different microservices, then there's something to be said about separating those teams and be having those teams be efficient where they are. I think you brought up the, the hugest point though is you need platform structure. You need someone there to basically uh, be the orchestrator of all of this in those cases to make sure all these teams know exactly what their, you know, sort of what their uh, directives are. Um, but size is going to be, I think, play the, the largest role in that type of conversation. You, 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 there's, there's no need to go into a, a small team uh, and build something in a hundred different languages. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so yeah, I think that's just the, the, the other takeaway from that. Yep. Uh, okay, we have uh, eight minutes left. Uh, so the last chance for ask a question from the audience. If everybody, if anyone is here on the audience and wants to ask a question, we have eight minutes left. Uh, okay, uh, so maybe let's talk a little bit about the TypeScript because uh, this is also something that didn't surprise me a lot. Uh, it, 80 84 percent uses TypeScript right now, and it's probably growing. So what about the TypeScript? This will be like, a, this is a, because some people try to make the competition between the JavaScript and the TypeScript, or this will be the one, or actually this already happened. I, th I think people forget that TypeScript is just a superset of JavaScript. I, I, I always find this whole discussion so odd. Like, what mm -hmm. should I use? What is, uh, TypeScript is just a superset mm -hmm. of JavaScript. There's no reason uh, to it's say a, one is better or worse, right? It's, I think it's this is more of the discussion between the static typing and the dynamic typing. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, and, yeah. <laughs> Which uh, happened uh, on the back end as well. True. I mean, uh, all, all I'll say to the subject is um, we run a very small team, at least at MCD. And so, um, the benefits of TypeScript are not nearly as large and, and uh, the applications tend to be smaller um, and that's totally fine. Now, if we implemented TypeScript, it would also be fine. <laughs> um, it, larger scales tend to work really well with TypeScript for that reason. You can, you know, you, you don't have to worry about um, that, that the, you don't, you don't have to worry about finding errors uh, after you've deployed the app, which is, that's great. Right. Um, I think the reason TypeScript is becoming more and more popular is simply because it it, it bakes in that protection, um, and and I don't think there's any reason to see that the TypeScript would ever uh, um, go down in popularity. I think it's got amazing support from Microsoft, which is a rarity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Microsoft is clearly backing it. Um, the community seems to love it. Uh, and and yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you want? You get all these benefits, right? IntelliSense right out of the box. Um, you know, as I type, I can know exactly where I'm, uh, where I'm creating issues. Uh, all the benefits that you get with very little overhead. I think people set, tend to believe there's a lot of work that goes into learning TypeScript, uh, setting up TypeScript. Those things have largely gone away. Uh, you can work in almost any framework nowadays and start with TypeScript right out of the box. Uh, and it's not some large leap that you're going to make. You're not learning a completely new programming language. So th it doesn't surprise me that it's as high up on the list uh, as it is, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yep. Also, uh, very high on the list of, uh, let's say, future technologies, because the part of the of the report is uh, is uh, what uh, is a question about uh, what, what how the future will look like, which uh, I will ask you for a second as well. 
Uh, and uh, but very high on this list of future technologies and gaining popularities is the uh, web assembly, which is 45%, which is kind of surprising. And uh, uh, Sandil, I just know that you have recently published a book about WebAssembly. So this question is probably for you. What <laughs> about this WebAssembly thing? Uh, I think it generally touches upon the TypeScript stuff that we talked about. Like typing is the major problem in the front-end world and dynamic type stuff, even though you're using TypeScript, the underlying code that is getting executed on the browsers is going to assume that it's coming from a dynamic type world and it's going to make those assumptions and every assumption that is you're making there will incur a performance cost for you. And that is a bigger general picture, right? And WebAssembly tries to avoid it. Like, hey, we have this generic system, generic system in the place. How can I infuse type into it? I cannot infuse type via JavaScript because that is not supported. That language is not built for it. What is the different way of doing it? And that's how WebAssembly came into picture. And it solved a lot of problem. It gives a huge performance benefit in specific cases, not for every case, in specific cases, it gives a huge performance improvement. But I also see, feel like in the front-end ecosystem, as I said, the front-end is slowly moving into back-end side of things. WebAssembly also putting its footprint over there. Now you can have a single application. Your application can have a single language written from mm -hmm. front to back. For example, with Rust, you can write both the back-end and the front-end with the Rust and deliver it to the application. So you need not have that specialized group of people. You can just have this group of audience who group of developers who kind of who delivers the end end to end application that's also another benefit that it's going to bring in and in general uh, it is like the ability to like for me what was fascinating about WebAssembly and that kind of hooked me into it is basically the ability to bring in your native code execute on the browser and that's a huge thing because i've worked on applets i know how messy they are and i'm like i've spent days and nights in fixing those security issues and in instructing my develop my users how to click the allow button over there and things like that. So I know the pain. WebAssembly kind of cleared that out. Like uh, last week or like last year, sometime around when I was in the COVID time, uh, I used to write this. Uh, I used to, con I converted my applet application into WebAssembly application. And it was super fun. And it was like everything that I wanted to do, I could do it much faster over there. And these are the specific use cases where it will have a lot of benefits. If you're writing IDE, if you're doing games, if you're having, if you're building applications, something like Earth, Google Earth and things like that, then WebAssembly is a way to go because it kind of like makes it easier for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, and uh, okay, so the last question uh, is, uh, uh, there will be probably a state of front end 2023 report. Uh, and uh, what will change? Will there be any changes or uh, or basically it will be boring report because this would be exactly the same thing? Jardley, what do you think? We are in the stable phase or uh, everything could change? Well, w w one thing that I don't expect in 2023, but over the years I'm going to expect is, and we haven't talked about it, building mobile apps mm. as well with front end. So, I think we're moving towards the future where you have one front end team that includes mobile and there's a lot of push back and, and I'm not saying it's going to be always the case and the, uh, Apple will not want this, but it is happening already, <laughs> for example, with React Native. Mm -hmm. A lot of teams have a React team and they have a React Native team. So I think over the years, mm -hmm. we're going to see this coming closer and closer and there will be, and that's one. And I also think we're, we're, we might have to break out a specialization between like there's going to be the your smaller teams who a small team builds everything, a small backend team and a small mobile team, and they ship uh, a mobile app, they ship a web app, and, and they're doing it great. And then you're going to have the big tech uh, or large companies who have a lot of resources, and they will have specialized. They'll have a native iOS, a native Android. They'll, they will they might have, you know, maybe even like multiple web teams uh, and, and, and those things. And they're going to do things very differently. And those might be the companies. They might still, you know, roll their own frameworks uh, or, or come up with their own, own things. But I think we're going to see this shift. And my hunch is that the majority of developers will be in this, you know, kind of unified world, but we'll, we'll have the specialists uh, in this other world. So, yeah. like, it'll be interesting to see this shift. And I think we should start to pay attention. Maybe in the next report, we can also 
think about it on, on how that plays out. But the big one I, I'm waiting for and I'm seeing already is, is more developing on mobile and how that's going to change. Yeah, it seems like a new level of full stack nicheness. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, exactly. OK, thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, for uh, your participation. Uh, really good talk. It was a pleasure uh, meeting with you and discussing those things. Thanks, uh, Joe. Sandu and uh, Dreadly. Uh, and uh, I will just paste, uh, if you want uh, from the uh, from the audience, if you want to, um, to, to contact with our speakers, I, I would just uh, paste their uh, LinkedIn profiles. This is what we usually do. And uh, I invite you, uh, uh, I also recommend other CTO Craft Bytes uh, events. Uh, next one will be, uh, announced quite soon uh, so thanks uh, thanks a lot uh, for the questions for the participation and uh, enjoy the rest of the day uh, for Joel this is the beginning of the day for us it's yeah. almost the weekend uh, so <laughs> thanks a lot and um, see you soon bye thanks guys bye all <laughs>